Welcome to another special edition of Daily Airline News covering the search for MH370. I'm Geoffrey Thomas, and once again, delighted to say I'm joined by UK aerospace engineer Richard Godfrey, who has taken Whisper uh, and worked with it to perfect a new technology to track the uh, aircraft like MH370 to a new location. And as per usual, um, Richard's going to give us an update on Amada 7806. Richard. Yes, uh, Amada 7806 is still working in the second survey area. Ocean Infinity are currently doing um, bathymetric survey work <clears throat> in preparation for a further underwater search for MH370. The interesting thing is the second survey area is much more compact than the first one they did uh, uh, now a couple of weeks back. And the AUV missions uh, um, are much shorter uh, in the current uh, survey area. Uh, we can follow Amada 7806 in some detail and, uh, and note each time it stops. It's uh, stopped on, on the second survey now 30 times. Um, when it gets interesting is when it stops at a location for a period of 30 to 90 minutes. Uh, the ship has an accurate uh, positioning system. And yesterday we showed how Amada 7806 hovered for six hours over one particular uh, location. And today we're showing some screenshots of the the last three locations where the ship came to a standstill and where there was uh, either AUV launch or recovery operations uh, quite likely uh, taking place. So there was uh, one, one time last night at 22.45 UTC, another at 3.30 this morning uh, UTC, and another at uh, 05.03 UTC. Fascinating stuff. It's uh, certainly uh, doing some extraordinary work down there, isn't it? Yeah, they they are indeed, and being very thorough and very detailed in filling in any gaps in the uh, uh, bathymetric data. Now, while we're on that subject, there were yesterday uh, there was a viewer question which was right at the very end of a rather long video. And uh, several people, again, have asked the same question today. So they obviously didn't watch the whole video. And that was, when it's doing this bathymetric survey, if it comes across MH370, it will see it, will it not? Yeah, it's quite uh, possible that uh, certainly a large debris field or larger items of wreckage will be seen. Right. Just want to get that one in. Now, yesterday you talked about some of the experts that you've worked with, uh, Richard, and I know there's a few more that you want to talk about. So perhaps you can give us a bit more insight into the various folks that you've worked with. Yeah, I'd like to mention in particular two gentlemen um, who've been working on MH370 the last 11 years and probably know the seabed floor in the MH370 search area, like the back of their hand. Uh, the first uh, is Pete Foley, who was uh, formerly the ATSB project director for MH370, and happens to be one of the few people I know who has a complete map of the search area uh, sea floor uh, at home. He has a, a printout of the the video from Geoscience Australia that we've shown several times. And this printout is uh, several meters long. Uh, and Pete uh, is uh, currently advising Ocean, Ocean Infinity uh, on the new search. And the, the other guy I'd like to mention is Andy Sherrill, who was the quality assurance manager at ATSB from uh, 2014 to 2018, and then joined Ocean Infinity in 2018 and is uh, uh, there until uh, the present time and is the Director of Maritime Operations uh, at Ocean Infinity. I mean, he has spent countless hours 
checking sonar images uh, from the search area uh, seafloor uh, over the last years, uh, the last 11 years now. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a great privilege um, for me and uh, my collaborators, Professor Simon Maskell and Dr. Hannes uh, Kurtzi. Uh, back in uh, June 2023, we had a conference call with Pete Foley and Andy Sherrill. Um, we discussed our whisper research and the potential utility for helping to find MH370. Uh, we also discussed the idea of Professor Simon Maskell to add the whisper data to the particle filter method of uh, analysis developed by Neil Gordon and colleagues at the Defence Science and Technology Group, uh, DSTG, in, in Australia. Another uh, eminent physicist and Nobel Prize winner and the man who invented uh, the WISPER protocol is uh, Professor Joe Taylor. Uh, he has now retired, but he is also a, a keen amateur radio enthusiast. And Professor Joe Taylor is on the record as stating, you cannot use WISPER to detect and track uh, aircraft. Now, another gentleman I've been working with is Christian Ensfelner. He's the chairman of the German Amateur Radio Society and uh, knows Professor Joe Taylor and has met him personally. Uh, Christian suggested setting up a conference call with Professor Joe Taylor, and Professor Simon Maskell, and Dr. Hannes Kurtzi and myself, where he would moderate a discussion on our whisper uh, work. Um, Joe Taylor, uh, unfortunately, uh, declined, but I have uh, uh, sympathy uh, that at the age of 83 is not uh, uh, willing to take uh, part uh, and participate in, in such uh, video conference calls. However, Christian uh, Ensfelner the, has invited me to speak on WISPER at the annual conference of the German Amateur Radio Society on the occasion of their 75th anniversary this year. And I'm sure this debate will continue amongst their uh, 30,000 uh, members. Uh, uh, yes, I'm mindful, indeed. <laughs> I'm mindful of the, the Arthur Schopenhauer uh, quote, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And thirdly, it is accepted as being self-evident. Yes, I've uh, certainly heard that one before, for sure. And uh, history is replete with uh, all sorts of technologies being used for things that they originally were not designed for. So, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so we're on to viewer questions, but before we do, uh, the viewers, are, a lot of viewers are coming back to us about the whisper, how does it work? Uh, and of course, Richard, you've done some demonstrations, but uh, a situation with YouTube is that uh, those videos are, are somewhat older and they don't display on the, uh, on, the, on the opening page. So what we've done is we've created a new subheading, Whisper, and uh, we have uh, moved uh, two of those to that location. So if you want to know anything about Whisper, look down to that particular category and there's two excellent videos that explain exactly how it works and also live demonstrations. Uh, so I do recommend you have a look at that. But again, Richard, we've had some great questions. Um, and one, um, the first one we start off with, uh, what are the odds that, that a previous search zone contains MH370, but we failed to detect it? Surely there's some chance that the wreckage blended into noise or complex terrain or was hidden in a sonar shadow? Interesting question. Yeah, <clears throat> ATSB did an analysis of uh, how, uh, how much of the search area they're um, absolutely sure to have covered, uh, ver various figures for different uh, areas at different times, between 95% and 98%. So yes, there is a small chance uh, it was missed. 
Next one is, again, this, this has been asked before, but it's, it's come up many times. And so, again, why does the Armada vessel not have supply ships accompanying it to the search field to avoid having to travel to Fremantle and back for supplies? Well, the reason is there are quite strict regulations about uh, ship-to-ship transfer in the middle of the ocean. Um, it's normally... Uh, restricted, especially when you want to transfer um, crew from one ship to another. It's not so restrictive if you just want to uh, transfer fuel or provisions. Um, the normal uh, accepted level is uh, a wave height of 1.5 meters maximum for crew transfer. And at the moment in the Indian Ocean, it's the wave height is 2.8 meters. So that's mm. the reason. Yep. Okay, well, that's a very good reason. I, don't, I wouldn't want to be transferred um, in those conditions. Does Richard believe that should OI discover MH370, that they would release the information immediately? Or is there a process they would go through before making it public? Yeah, there is a process and they will go through that uh, before making it public. Um, the first process is identifying a point of interest. The second is going back to that point of interest and uh, doing a more in-depth uh, investigation. Uh, if any debris uh, or wreckage is identified, then they will map out that debris field uh, to know for sure whether they have uh, found MH370 or uh, some other aircraft or ship wreckage. And then finally, they will send an ROV down to take uh, pictures and videos of uh, the, the debris. And I think at that stage, when the convinced uh, they have found MH370, they will then make an announcement. Next question, still on the wreckage, and this one follows very well. Um, what state is the wreckage likely to be in after 11 years at the bottom of the ocean? And is it likely still to be recognisable, uh, or could they pass over it and not see it? I think the wreckage field will be similar to that of uh, Air France 447. So you will have literally hundreds and, and thousands of items of different sizes. The larger items like uh, engine cores or landing gear, um, pieces of the wing or fuselage will be uh, relatively easy to uh, recognize and uh, smaller items could well be passed over. But once you found a larger item, then you will look thoroughly in that area for, for all uh, uh, items of different size. So I don't think uh, uh, it will be missed. And I think we've covered this before with you, Richard, that um, a light dusting or a light covering of silt or sand or whatever the a the AUV can see through that and detect the metal uh, underneath. Yeah, one viewer asked uh, whether uh, the AUV has a magnetometer and able to detect uh, metal, uh, and uh, the answer is yes, it does. The last question and a very good one: Are we very close to finding it finally? I hope you guys can answer this one for tomorrow's podcast. Well, it would be nice to think we're close to, to finding it. However, uh, I remind you the current uh, agreement, which is still not signed, is proposed uh, to have a, a duration of 18 months. So the, the view is it will certainly be found in the next 18 months. Whether it's uh, found in, in the next few weeks, uh, uh, is uh, open to uh, speculation. Yes, I don't can't, can't quite imagine us doing this in eighteen months' time. But uh, let's hope it's sooner than later for the relatives left behind. But uh, yeah, look, thank you again, Richard, uh, for answering those questions and 
bringing us up to date with uh, the, the locale of 7806 and what she is doing. And uh, viewers, we're going to take a break tomorrow. And I might remind you that the last time we took a break tomorrow, there was some breaking news. So it may well be that we'll be back tomorrow with some uh, breaking news that Malaysia has finally signed this contract. Otherwise, you'll see us on Sunday. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you for all the likes. Please subscribe to us. And once again, Richard, thank you for your time and trouble. You're very welcome. Good night.